Uh, anyways, I'm Sydney. Uh, I work at IAPAF. It's a digital rights nonprofit. If you are curious about our work, um, we have a booth downstairs. I won't spend too much time talking about it. Uh, but I work on our technical projects team, uh, in particular on the team that works on uh, internet security projects. Uh, so for instance, this is the same team that uh, created Let's Encrypt um, for you know, issuing certificates, uh, and also, I also work on CertBot part-time, uh, which is a client for Let's Encrypt, uh, the thing that you put on your web server to talk to Let's Encrypt uh, and obtain TLS certificates. Um, sometimes I wrote blog posts about other things that I know about. Um, if you're curious about, uh, curious about those things, I can talk to you about them later. Uh, but today I'm talking mostly about email and fixing email server encryption. Um, cool. So, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, can I do a survey of the room? I really, so I listed this as easy. I didn't know what the crowd would really be like, but I think I'll like ask here and then I know, I'll, then I'll know what time, how much time to spend on what. Um, I'm curious, how many of you guys are system administrators? Okay. Um, how, how many of you would say you're familiar with TLS? Okay, okay, so I'll still like explain that a little bit, I think, unless you need to know. Um, what about start TLS? Okay. Uh, oh, wait, one more question, because I'm really curious. How many guys administer an email server? I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, okay, wonderful. Um, cool, so I guess in this talk, I'll, I'll mostly be uh, talking about server-to-server uh, -server email encryption. This doesn't have to do with PGP, I'm sorry. Um, I'll explain that a little bit in one of the slides, uh, but it really means uh, when two email servers are talking to each other, uh, over SMTP, is that uh, connection secure? Uh, and how far have we come since the Snowden era when people started actually caring about this stuff? Um, cool. Well, I switched slide and then, okay. Oh yeah, okay, it's not that much. Um, so Encrypt the Web uh, is the name of a team that EFF I was on for a really long time. Uh, but then at some point I was like, it was actually me that requested that we change this because I'm a nitpicking fool. Um, can we change it to encrypt the internet, right? Because Let's Encrypt and CertBot both, like we both focus on um, web server encryption, um, but like TLS certificates can be used to encrypt any kind of traffic. Um, brief aside, TLS equals encryption. Yeah. Um, yeah, they can be used to encrypt any sort of packet anywhere. Um, and in the past year, I've worked on changes to CertBot to make it work better with uh, software that isn't web server software, uh, things like this. Uh, so today, I'm, go I'm going to be talking about TLS for email in particular, um, who I think has been particularly left behind um, for the, uh, behind this push for like TLS and stuff. Um, email security has been incomplete for so long now that it's really popular in a lot of infosec circles to shit on it. Um, so I'm going to say that I love email. Um, yeah, it's great. It's the first. It's like one of the first decentralized protocols to ever exist and work. Like it's, I think, almost a decade older than HTTP or something, and we still use it. Like we're still stuck with it. Um, yeah, like we're not going to give up on email and like use Slack and Signal for everything. And that's just not going to happen. Um, so yeah, that's that's my spiel. Hopefully that uh, those two sentences convinced you that email is worth worrying about and worth caring about. Um, wait, no, before the slide. Sorry, I the slides are out of order. The other thing is that email is being used um, today as if it's like if it's like people they like shit on email and then they use it for like password backups and password resets and then th like these are honestly great UX improvements, right? Like. Um, you know, if I'm on the phone, it's like hard to type things. Also, like I probably can't use my hardware security key or something um, because it's annoying. Uh, so I'll send an email to myself, open that email on my phone, and then click the link. Um, but like all of these things, sort of, you know, that means the weakest link is email. Um, so today we'll be talking about mostly like dragnet surveillance of email. Um, yeah, and everything on the internet is unencrypted by default, so it's like passing a note to your friend. Uh, are on the other side of the classroom, except one of the people in the middle is the NSA. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we know that they care about email, so they have been doing dragnet surveillance. These were leaked in the Snowden, um, Snowden revelations. 
when I'm like feeling overworked, I go back and read some of these slides and be like, oh, okay, yeah, this is real. Um, yeah, so they care about our email, they're logging every, everything. You can imagine that guy at the computer over there is like that person at the desk. Um, yeah, they, you can imagine that this is on some bureaucrat's screen, like uh, they're, they're snooping all our emails. Um, they want to be able to search through them, search who's talking to who, about what, like, um, all the time. Uh, okay, so there's our motivation. Hopefully all of you are motivated. Um, outline, I, yeah, I should have made this more specific, but what's wrong? A demo of the bad thing and then how we can fix the bad thing. Um, so for a high level overview for those of you who may not be deep into the email server world or haven't run a mail server before, um, this is pretty much you know, exactly what email looks like all the time. Um, so you have some uh, user-facing client like Gmail or Thunderbird, um, and so that's you here, so you're on the website. And then when you send an email, when you compose and send an email on that little box, what uh, that client does is it shuttles that off to your mail server. So for instance, if I'm on like ProtonMail and I'm using their web client, it'll shut it, shuttle it off to the ProtonMail's uh, mail servers. Um, and then uh, ProtonMail will see that it's addressed to someone at bff.org and magic, something magical happens. Uh, and then all of that mail uh, designated for EFF uh, arrives at EFF's mail servers. Um, and then after that, uh, I will open Thunderbird or, um, you know, if, Around, or whatever like mail client I use, and then it talks to EFF's mail server, like, hey, did I get any mail for Sydney? And it'll say yes or no, and shuttle that off. And in particular, so these two uh, connections are usually fine, they're over TLS, and the reason uh, those are encrypted is because these two usually have a trusted relationship. Right? Like, I know EFF mail, I know that EFF mail is going to deliver my mail only over TLS, or like this port, which only uses TLS ever. Same with the delivery here. Um, so the problem really is here, and that's where like so that, those eyes, so that's NSA. Um, that's where the dragnet surveillance can happen uh, because there's not as much of a trusted relationship between these two entities. Um, cool. Oh, uh, let me actually talk briefly about PGP here. Actually, um, so in terms of PGP, uh, the reason we still care about TLS, even if everybody in the world uses PGP. Um, is because of metadata leakage. So let's say I end-to-end um, -end encrypt an email um, to you. Even if that happens, if this connection isn't over, the t over TLS, um, like large dragnet surveillance systems could still know that I was talking to you, uh, at what time I was talking to you, and often the subject of the email that I sent. Um, and uh, hiding a lot of this metadata would require a lot of changes to SMTP itself, which is going to take a long time. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, start TLS is HTTPS for email. That's, you can imagine that is the case. Um, so EFF has this um, initiative, I guess, called Start TLS Everywhere. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer, and we will talk about that soon. Uh, it was coined essentially in 2014, um, back when no mail servers actually even used Start TLS. Um, but now it's like doing pretty good. So this is a graph uh, from the Gmail's transparency report that shows the number of inbound emails that are encrypted using Start TLS uh, from like 2014 till now. Uh, and 2014 it was like a fourth. Uh, then lots of uh, activism happened. People cared about this thing because of the 2013 Snowden stuff. Um, people were like, let's actually TLS encrypt everything. Uh, and then you can see it slowly move up. Um, so, is there also an um, Let's Encrypt show that? Uh, yeah, so I'm not, so I would say I think Let's Encrypt happened around here. Um, so the thing that has been, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but in the email world, self signed certificates work and they count in here. So they don't even have to be issued by like a valid CA or anything. So it, it didn't actually have a, as much of an impact then as like, Google implementing TL, start TLS for their mail server or requiring it, uh, or like uh, Microsoft Outlook turning it on for like all of their businesses, uh, business customers. 
Um, but yeah, so gold star. Um, yeah, uh, so we still have 30 minutes. No, I mean, yeah, I'm kidding. Okay, um, yeah, let's do a demo of what actually happens and why this isn't, really isn't enough. Um, so in order to demonstrate this, I'm going to set up this situation and punk myself. Um, I'm gonna, so I have a mail server set up called Sidline, um, and I'm going to try send an email to Gmail, and then I'm going to set up like a proxy here that is looking at all of the traffic. Um, I'll try to explain everything that's going on, uh, but yeah, let's do it. Nothing could go wrong. Uh, one second. I'm gonna mirror my display so I don't have to like awkwardly uh, shift my head all the time. So. So I have this mail server um, that I set up a while ago. Uh, actually, I'll do a quick plug here too. Um, if you have never run a mail server before and you would like to, this is a really good um, foot in the door. Uh, it's mail in a box. It's essentially like uh, one command setup of your email server and, a lot, like, uh, and all of the DNS stuff you need, like SPF, DKIM, all of these uh, acronyms that are related to getting your email server to work correctly. Um, you have to point internet things to your uh, DNS server and your mailbox uh, correctly, but there's a really well-written English guide uh, on how to do all of those things. So this is how I set up the, this toy mail server. As you can see, I have been using it for testing. Um, so yeah, so this is sidley.me. Um, let me make sure I'm still like logged in. Um, and I'll be communicating with this um, Jen Zhang persona that I've used at, at various times, but I didn't have a Gmail account for her. Um, so I created one. Uh, so, okay. Oh, yeah. So uh, here is the box. It's a host name. This is box.sidley.me. Uh, um, and I'm just going to show you that I have everything set up correctly, I promise. Um, well, I mean, mail in a box did it for me, but uh, so yeah, so you can see I have TLS on. Um, I don't, I'm not using these uh, self signed snake oil certificates. We have real uh, certificates that are provisioned by Let's Encrypt, um, which you can also see here. It's the same, uh, the same certificate. Uh, cool. Um, and then, so what I'm going to do uh, is essentially, so I want all of my outgoing mail from this box to go into a proxy, and I want that proxy to see everything that's going on and then forward it to Gmail. Um, so I'm going to just use like a port that's not being used, 2525. Um, anything that's not 25 is fine. Uh, and then six reload. Um, and for the proxy itself, I'm going to use this cool tool. Um, StripTLS, it's essentially like um, MITM proxy, if you've uh, used MITM proxy before, but for things that aren't HTTP, uh, and it, in particular, work, tries to do like funky stuff with your TLS, uh, start TLS connections. Um, so, uh, I have already installed it. Uh, so it's like a Python module. Uh, Ask it to listen on 2525. Oh yeah, so I need a, a remote. And what that means is like, remote is uh, where it's going to shuttle the, uh, the connection after it's done its stuff with it, like looked at it, changed it, whatever. Um, and so it's going to be Gmail. So, um, sorry, I'm just going to, this is the uh, mailbox for Gmail. Mm. Um, and then I think, um, so for now, I'm going to uh, tell it not to actually do anything. Um, 
Oh, to make it more clear, let me clear it in. Okay, cool. So that should be working, I hope. Um, let's send an email from ProtonMail, or sorry, uh, uh, Sidley, Sidline, um, to Jane Fang. Hello. Um, cool. So uh, this is the body of the email. If we hit send, I hope this works. Yes, I think it worked. Um, you can see that it arrived. Everything's fine. Uh, I told you I set everything up correctly. Um, it's got TLS according to Gmail. And if we look under the hood, um, oh my god, it spit out all this stuff. Um, so this is all actually the encrypted session. So it's all garbage from the perspective of a network attacker. If the two people end up manage to uh, negotiate an encrypted uh, connection successfully, it should look like garbage. Um, you can actually see, for those of you, oh man, you can actually see like the CA names in here. This is like the certificate exchange. So you can see like this, there's like global sign in here somewhere. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Okay, uh, but the part that is interesting, sorry, this is a little uh, jarbled and difficult to see. Uh, but here's the uh, SMTP handshake. So hello, I'm uh, box.sidley.me, uh, and then Google says, hi, it's me, um, Google, your friend. I, <laughs> these are all of the features that I have. So I support all of these things, 250 size, 8 bit mine. Uh, the one we care about is 250 start TLS. Um, and so the next thing that we say is, okay, I want that feature. Uh, turn that on, please. Uh, and then Yes, and then the next thing is that handshake um, that you can see. There's lots of zeros. That's what it looks like. Yeah, so that worked. Um, so let's go back to the presentation for one second. Um, okay. Yeah, demo one, all is good. All right, so this is what we just saw. It's just shuttling al on, uh, along encrypted packets. Um, under the hood, that's what it looks like. Those are the important bits of the conversation. The rest is like other email stuff. Um, and then the green stuff is all encrypted, so we can't see anything. Uh, okay, demo two. Oh no, what's going on? Um, so what we're going to do is, even though both servers support encryption, um, this person who's sitting in the middle is going to do something terrible and then prevent them from actually starting the encrypted session. Um, so let's do that. Uh, wait, I have to look at my notes one sec. What it's called. Okay, um, sorry, I did that so I didn't have to look at the documentation. Um, so this is one of the, uh, like, a, a, I guess, attack vectors you can set this proxy to do. It's really cool. I highly recommend using it to audit uh, your mail server software if you write it. Um, yeah, so if you run this, uh, yeah, it should be ready to do the bad thing. So, do the same thing. Um, okay, so I, I sent this reset password email, um, and you know my last email went over at TLS, so I expect it to be the same. Um, but no, like there's like this little TLS icon. Um, but this is really nice, a nice feature of Gmail, but you have to trust that Gmail tells you the truth. In this case, we can actually tell that it's telling the truth. Um, but yeah. Uh, also, uh, this icons like this, UX is really important for security. Side note, uh, this single-handedly raised the start TLS adoption rate by a lot, just like this icon. Um, anyway, so this is really nice. I know that my password reset was not encrypted for some reason, even though uh, I have encrypted with Sidline successfully in the past. Um, oh, yeah, let's look under the hood uh, at what happened. Um, cool, so uh, yeah, as the proxy, I was able to sniff out the password. It's 102 right here. Um, the way we were able to do this, okay, let me see if I can, is this still like legible at all? Probably not. Um, that's okay, okay, I'm just gonna highlight it. Um, so essentially, 
this was changed to this. Um, and what happened here is that this, this uh, start TLS feature was just removed from the, uh, the text and then forwarded to Gmail, or sorry, forwarded to the in incoming, forwarded to me actually. Um, so essentially this looks like, from our perspective, from the SIDLIMES box perspective, um, Gmail doesn't support start TLS at all. Uh, and so we didn't ask for it because it's not a feature that they offered. Um, Uh, so this is what that looks like. This is called a, a StartTLS downgrade, start, StartTLS stripping, whatever. Basically, the encrypted connection, something that would have been encrypted, was just downgraded to an unencrypted connection, which is unfortunate. Um, and the, the biggest deal about this is that it's so easy to do. Um, everybody does it, or a lot of people do it regularly uh, still. Um, Jacob, who's actually uh, walking around here, uh, wrote this article in 2014 about uh, ISPs in the US and in Thailand uh, performing this attack uh, regularly on their customers. Um, it was like a default setting on one of the boxes that a lot of ISPs were using at the time. And it was advertised as like a feature, like, oh, you can inspect your um, customer's email. Um, yeah, and so this is from one of those customers. Uh, essentially, they connected to Google. You might recognize this. They're, they connected to Google from their, oh, sorry, their mail server, uh, and they, they got that back this like weird um, text where the start TLS advertisement or like a feature advertisement should have been. Um, so this is actually like sort of like proof that uh, this uh, their ISP was doing this. Um, and so if you do like a wide internet scan. Gmail and some uh, public or researchers from University of Michigan were looking at essentially downgrade uh, rates across the world. Um, you can see like something's going on in Tunisia. Maybe they're all using this like Cisco middle box that um, downgrades email encryption by default. Um, but yeah, if you look at certain countries, you can tell that like they're doing this really really regularly. Um, I so we've been trying to get them to do this study again, because this information is really important if you live in this country and send email, or if you operate an email, or if you want to operate an email server business in this country in particular. Um, okay, and so it's worse. Um, so at least for this demo, it's like sort of uh, detectable, right? So it was kind of weird because I noticed that uh, this email that had been sent to me over an encrypted connection before was downgraded. And for some reason, Sidline is sending the email over uh, an unencrypted connection. Uh, so I recognized something was wrong. Um, but the, the way that security in the emails ecosystem works, um, you can, so uh, certificates are tie your domain name to a public key, which is, and that public key is used in the encrypted session. Um, so that domain name is not verified in most uh, SMTP connections. Um, so pretty much anyone uh, in the middle can be like, hey, like this is my certificate for gmail.com. Um, and since there's no validation that happens on the majority of SMTP connections, uh, this uh, attack is possible. Um, yeah, so this is a, a man in the middle like uh, impersonation attack. Um, and we can do that too. Intercept. Okay, um, let me clear this to make it more obvious what's going on. Um, note that uh, this time it generated like a certificate, and it'll use that in the actual connection. Secret, um, shuttle, shuttle it off, and yeah. So this time it looks like like there's no red flags or anything. It just looks like it's a regular encrypted email. Um, but in reality, like our proxy was able to get the contents of the message. Um, it essentially so so this, these mangled tags show you like the lines that were changed. Um, and these are all the TLS handshake uh, 
lines. And what it does here is it presents a different certificate uh, that it owns a private key for in place of Gmail's. Um, and so that's bad because we can now like, I didn't actually finish making the slide, but we can actually look into the encrypted contents of the email, but from both perspectives, it looks like the encrypted connection was completed successfully. Um, yeah, why is it like this? Why? So that's the end of the demo. Um, I'm gonna go back to split three in one second. Uh, you guys don't see what's going on. <sighs> okay, it's better. Changes. Okay, yeah, so why, why is it like this? Why does it suck? Um, okay, so. So uh, just, just some general facts about the email ecosystem that will help contextualize all of these security problems. Um, so web, like people, in general, the web is more secure than SMTP delivery. And I think part of the reason for that is because email is so decentralized. Like this um, pro is also a con in terms of doing security upgrades. So the number of browsers that people use, probably like three to five, but more effectively like two because they're all forks of Chromium. Um, <laughs> like, so it's Firefox and Chromium, basically. And the number of MTA clients that people use is like way more than that, right? Like all of these proprietary uh, mail providers have their own implementations because email is really complicated and they need their own guarantees and they don't open source it because it's their special sauce that they sell to corporations. Um, and there's like Postfix and Exim on all of these open source uh, like, MTA clients that people use. Um, so when the browsers want to do a security upgrade, pretty much like Chromium and like Mozilla get in a room and like, hey, like let's do TLS 1.3 next week. Like, oh, cool. Yeah, do you want to add these like post quantum TLS suites? Like, oh yeah, sure. And so yeah, like it's crazy because the web is going to have like post quantum uh, cipher suites before I think email has like authenticated encryption. Um, but that's just because it's so decentralized. Uh, and the other problem is that there's no equivalent of this page for email. So for email, um, when you send an email, it's right now, right now there's no way to say, hey, I would really, this is like a password reset email, I would really prefer if it were encrypted. Um, and there's also no, no way to say, hey, this is like, um, this is a pager notification um, to someone who needs to fix this thing immediately, otherwise we lose $1 billion. Um, there's no way to say, hey, I don't really care if this is encrypted or not because I want that $1 billion to not be gone. Um, in, in web, there is a synchronous way for you to express your desire uh, for either of these properties. Uh, in email, it's asynchronous, so the way that you have to do this is with like bounce emails um, and like you would also have to implement something in S an extension to S SMTP itself, um, which people are working on. Um, but it's not, it's not as simple as uh, something like this. You can't as easily shuttle off the decision to the user. So then this, the decision is on the sysadmin who's being pressured to do all of these things um, and deliver email. Um, so yeah, so people are more reluctant to upgrade the security because if you're stricter, then that means you lose more emails. Um, yeah, so that's generally more contextualizing. Um, so how do we fix all of these things? The things that we want, we want servers to be able to say, hey, I support TLS. Um, this also, this is how you validate my identity. This is how you validate my public key uh, in order to prevent the impersonation attack. Uh, and also, it cannot be downgradable. You can't just like uh, downgrade the more secure, more secure version to the unauthenticated version. Um, so I, I think this this list is technically complete, but I I'm, I also typically add these two things because of the previous problems I just mentioned. Um, the other thing that you want is people to use it, and so that means it doesn't break things, uh, and then number two, it's like relatively easy to set up. Um, yeah, so those are, those are the hardest things, I would say, to get right in email. Um, oh, cool, so uh, this is a picture of a great day. Um, there is this security, um, 
So the traditional way in email to do authenticated security is a technology called DAIN. Uh, it's built on top of a technology called DNSSEC. Um, I'm curious, how many people in the room have heard of DNSSEC? Okay, cool. What about DAIN? Okay, less. Okay, cool. Um, and so the way that DAIN works um, is, this is very, very high level. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really have that much time to get more into it. Um, essentially, when you talk to DNS and get these records, you get some sort of validation that mail EFF, the person who owns EFF.org is the person who said these statements. Um, and once you get that validation, those check marks in the, in the encoder, when you do the SMTP connection and then you get all this information like, oh, I'm mail, uh, you have the org, I support TLS, this is my public key, you can cross uh, correlate that information uh, to make sure that it's valid. Um, yeah, so I, DNSSEC also has a nice property that you can't downgrade it because if you support or you are, uh, if you support DNSSEC, you also have to provide a proof of non-existence. Um, so if someone bad tried to like block the discovery of some of those records and say, and, oh no, like what, what is a public key? I don't know. Uh, and just like block that message, um, you would be like, that's weird because uh, for DNSSEC, you're supposed to provide a proof of non-existence for those records. Um, so it's not downgradable, which is wonderful. Um, the people use it part is um, less wonderful. Um, so it doesn't break things. Security upgrades, uh, especially email, have a first mover's disadvantage. Um, Comcast was one of the first people to start validating day, um, and they, it turns out HBO, or like you know, some other streaming services, uh, Dane configuration was broken. Um, so Comcast, would, like customers of Comcast couldn't access HBO. Uh, and, then, and then everyone was like, what are you doing? That's anti-competitive. But in reality, they were trying to do this wonderful security thing, right? Um, so then they stopped doing that. I don't know if they started doing that afterwards. Uh, but I think that illustrates there's a, there's a disadvantage to enforcing these things. Um, and then the last thing is, it's, it's sort of difficult to set up right. In order to validate DNSSEC uh, properly, or in order to get that check mark to actually be a check mark, you have to do this complicated thing with like setting up a local resolver that like validates DNSSEC correctly. All of these words um, mean it's hard to do properly. And if you don't do everything properly, then you rely on your ISP's DNSSEC validating resolver. Um, and then you're just back to having to trust another, another party. Um, so uh, all of these things mean that a lot, it, like uh, the adoption of data and DNSSEC has been sort of slow. Um, although I think data itself is, has been good, or like going up recently. Um, so a lot of people were like, okay, it's been like 20 years or something um, since people started saying that we should use this. Uh, let's try something else. Um, so I, I'm running out of time a little bit, but anyway, so MTSCS is this RFC that dropped, I think, end of last year. Um, and if you've heard of HSTS, it's sort of the same thing for email, kind of, but more complicated because it's email and everything's more complicated uh, for email. Uh, and so the way that it works is um, before I, a ProtonMail actually like makes the email connection, it'll ask, uh, it'll do the, like a DNS query anyways um, for the email's mailbox address. And then with that mailbox address, DNS also says, oh, by the way, this person supports MTSTS. Um, and what that means is ProtonMail will like, oh, okay, I'll look up their MTSDS contract. Um, and this contract is going to say, uh, give them information on how to validate it, like my host name is going to be mail.eff.org, it's for TLS, this will not change for three months. So it's sort of like a, a time-bound contract uh, for the next three months. And upon the first discovery of this contract, uh, your connection with them is going to be secure for the next three months. Uh, yeah, and so ProtonMail is going to remember that, uh, that contract and uh, cache it. That's the caching part. Um, the problem with MTSCS is that it, it is still downgradable. It's harder to downgrade, um, but it is still uh, downgradable. Someone, yeah, I didn't finish reading the slide either, um, but yeah, someone evil could just like block the discovery of MTSCS um, because in this world, uh, the idea of MTSCS is that it works without authenticated DNS. Um, so you have to assume that you're like, you, you don't really trust the DNS uh, network. Um, the good thing is that if you, it's harder to have both a man in the middle position on your DNS and on your um, email at like SMTP connection sometimes. Um, 
but it's still hard. Uh, and the other good news is that if, like, you have to downgrade them each time they send email to this person. You can't ever let them discover this contract, because once they discover the contract, then they're set uh, for that period of time. Um, right, so yeah, it's not downgradable. It's not uh, anti-downgradable. Um, and then those, those last things are like, questionable, too. Um, so anyway, so uh, EFF has had this project which you know, stored the TLS, cached the TLS policies of a bunch of different domains. Uh, and we're currently in the middle of migrating it to a sort of like uh, MTSTS preload list um, and like uh, preload uh, a, like a JSON file with the MTSTS policies of a bunch of people and then ship it into a bunch of different mail servers so that it's less downgradable for at least common mail servers. Um, so that's uh, our project with it, but I think that's less interesting than the actual uh, protocol. So some preloading, like maybe it'll fix the downgrade thing. We're not sure yet. Um, also, you know, does, do people use it? Um, it doesn't break things. We're not sure. It's easy to set up. We're not sure. It's really new. Um, so at least for the it doesn't break things part, um, this is also a problem with Zane. Um, you know, if I'm poor, how do I know? Or I'm running a mail service for like my family, and like that's it, and I'm not like a multi-billion dollar corporation. Uh, how do I know if my mail server is broken? Usually, I just like wait for someone to complain. Um, <laughs> uh, or you could like set up monitoring infrastructure. Um, and the gap between two, these two are like surprisingly large. I know I've, I I'm supposed to set up monitoring infrastructure on my email server, but I haven't um, just because I'm lazy, and it doesn't doesn't affect me that much. Um, so uh, there's this new RFC that rolled out with MTSTS yes, called TLS Report, um, and it aims to sort of be a middle ground uh, between these two things. Uh, the way that it works is it just says, hey, you know, if you get a TLS failure, tell the person. Um, that's a yeah, that's the high level overview, um, and so maybe that will fix that. It doesn't break things. Maybe but all of this is very um, early, uh, and then. The easy to set up thing, um, we're hoping that we'll see more. So we're waiting on Postfix and Exim or and like other open source MTAs to implement it. That would be wonderful so it's easier for people to set up. Right now, there's not a really, really easy way to do it, um, although there are some, uh, there are some implementations uh, of a, like a daemon that does all the caching for you that you can put on your Postfix server. And we can talk about that later, too. Um, yeah, okay, so TLS report also works for Dane. Um, so the idea is like this uh, closing the feedback loop of email TLS configurations will help push forward some security in the ecosystem. Yeah, so yeah, so what do you do? Right? Like this is essentially this XKCD. It's basically a bunch of people being like, oh, no one's using this thing. Let's make this other thing. Um, so, uh, I'm of the opinion that we should do, like, uh, all of these things have their own uses in their different ways, uh, and I think they are all wonderful. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to push for both of them. Um, so, yeah, uh, so, yeah, Zerbot, so let's encrypt. Um, it's wonderful. Um, it works better with mail servers now. Uh, yeah. So when you use standalone, uh, that's the mode that you should use it if you're not trying to get a certificate for a web server. Remember to automate renewal, all of these things. Um, yeah, use start TLS. Use authenticated uh, with like a CA authenticated cert uh, certificates. Um, yeah, if your TLB is DNS signed, you can put up Dane records. Um, this is another problem with Dane. If you're, let's say you're hosting a mail server and the domain name is like, uh, the TLD is some country that doesn't ever want to t DNSX sign uh, their domain. Uh, then if you have a domain from that country, you're kind of screwed uh, because you can't do Dane or any of the fancy DNSX things. Um, I think Victor Dukovny's I Can Talk is really, really wonderful uh, on a guide, like, uh, a guide for common pitfalls uh, and strategies to do this better. Um, let's crypt plus Dane works. Uh, we're working, or I'm, I guess I'm working on ways to make this integration even better. Uh, yeah, that's the certbot issue. If you care about this, please comment there. 
and, or like plus one the issue so that we get more signal that it, it is important to people and now we'll work on it sooner. Um, and then to get it to work with Dang, uh, the reuse key option is good. Um, oh yeah, so not Dang validation, uh, except for the people on that list. Oh yeah, keep an eye out for our MKS guest week. Do, uh, do all these things. Yeah, it's a lot, I'm sorry. It's a lot of things. Um, if you are, if you code, um, this would be wonderful. Uh, MTA STS is sort of like missing everywhere, and so it's not going to move if we don't work on it. Um, I might also be working on this soon, but we'll see. Uh, so this is the thing I was talking about earlier. Uh, this is like a sort of separate daemon that uh, will translate, will do like um, the DNS lookup for you, but also do the caching for MTA STS for you. And you could try it out. Yeah, and also if you write code and you build things, there aren't that many TLS, report, uh, TLS reporting integrations with um, common monitoring software. So um, also Gmail just turned this on last week. So if you set up TLS report, you'll actually start getting um, reports to your domain. Um, and I think people are working on monitoring software now that someone's actually sending reports, um, but I'm not sure about this. So you guys should do it. I already wrote that. Um, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll fly to our jobs. This is my shill slide. Donate money so I stay employed. Um, more references. Okay, cool. Um, I would love to take questions if that's something people are interested in. I'm sorry that we only have like five minutes left. Uh, does mail in a box work with the latest version of Ubuntu? I remember... Huh, that's a good question. I haven't uh, tried. This This box is from a while ago, so I don't think it's uh, up to date. Um, is the Dingo one the latest one? Uh, Dingo's the latest, but last I checked, it only kind of worked on Xenio, and it wasn't officially supported on Bionic. I see. Yeah, I don't know. If you have um, time and interest, you can help okay. contribute to mail in a box, too. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I was surprised just with the breadth of things being included that you didn't include like TGP keys uh, hoisted into DNS as well. Yeah, you could you can do that too. I'm sorry for yeah, the very broad uh, list of things that I included. Sometimes people get angry if I don't include their things. Um, and then, so in terms of PGB keys, I did talk a little bit about uh, why like end-to-end -end encrypted email is a different problem. Um, we, if you want, I can talk about that later. I have ideas. Okay. Yeah. So how does um, SPF records come into it? Or is it still like man in the middle with DNS? Yeah, so SPF records, uh, so most of uh, email technology is for authenticating the sender. Uh, let me uh, put it this way. So um, so all of the complex complexity around email so far uh, has to do with preventing spam from entering your mailbox. And so a lot of these things that you've heard of, other like, just to throw out other acronyms, SPF, DKIM, DMARC, um, all of these things have to do with authenticating senders. Um, whereas security things, you want to authenticate the receiver of mail. So let's say I'm, I'm Sid Lime and I'm sending email to Gmail. I want to authenticate that they support TLS, they do all of these things. So it's sort of the opposite direction of things. Um, yeah, so, SPF, DKIM, DMARC are like security in a different way, um, or like are built for security in a, a different context, in a different way. Um, and it, it sort of makes sense because spam, um, if you get more spam, you like the mail service less and you don't want to use it, and then the mail service loses, loses money. And money drives a lot of decisions that are made in the world, unfortunately. Uh, one, one thing that uh, might be useful to you if, you if you run your own mail server is a service called help checks the file. Yeah. And it is, it is free software. And basically, like, you set up a cron job that emails a particular address, and then they will tell you uh, if, uh, if your uh, mail server is down. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks. What was that saying? <coughs> help I checks will the file. I will happily help you show this. Okay. Um, yeah. 
That sounds wonderful. I, yeah, I you have. Click on the email that's attached to it. That's good. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really cool. So here is a really easy open source way to monitor your email health status. Um, another thing, I guess, I, while we're talking about these hard denies, um, support. <laughs> so hard denies also has really nice uh, reports for um, um, for mail servers and stuff like that. It's more complete than like SSL labs, at least for email, um, that I found. So we could do like, something like, yeah, gmail.com, and you can see uh, stuff like SPF and DMARC as well. Um, all of the things that we talked about for secure transport. I have a question. Um, so, so you mentioned some of the data that you showed came from a, a transparency report that Google published. Yeah. Are there like what other sources of data do you have when looking at this? Yeah. So um, another tool. I'm just thing showing you things that I use. Another tool that I use is <coughs> called Census. So this was developed by those same researchers that did that same. Um, Okay. research paper that I uh, had the figure from with okay. the countries and the downgrade attacks. And so they took their back backend, which is called called ZMAP. It, that might be more familiar to some people. A ZMAP and then transformed it into like this really nice search tool. Um, if you know how to use ZMAP, you can use ZMAP too, but this is a little bit more um, user friendly. And it essentially searches the entire IPv4 space, or you can set it to search the top million domains. Um, and it does like <laughs> security protocol stuff. Um, I wish I had some queries, like I think there's a way you can do that same uh, start to less stripping query um, if they're doing the thing where they turn the banner into X's. Uh, so you can do an internet wide search for that fingerprint uh, of a particular like uh, band in the middle attack, um, I think. So this, is, this project is actively polling the world? Yeah. It's like there was a tag called like start tail stripping or something. Um, I, I can't remember. Um, but they compile their research into like different like tags so that they can update it live. Um, but we can't do something uh, more comprehensive. We can only look at fingerprints. So if the adversary, for instance, just removes the start tail spanner instead of transforming it, then that's not detectable. You need to have both sides uh, collaborating to detect that change. Because otherwise, it just looks like, uh, from our perspective, that they don't support TLS. Cool. What's up? Um, can you talk a little bit about how to automate the, your cert web cert bot? <laughs> sure. Um, you said like the standalone option? Yeah, so uh, cert bot, by it's on some distros, we really should document this better. On some distros, it comes with an auto, uh, a cron job that is automatically installed. Um, in some distros, it doesn't. Um, so what you should do if it doesn't is just run certbot renew uh, once every three months, and that should be fine. Um, if you use Dane, it's a little bit more complicated, but that uh, website that I linked in the slides. So this, do you need like a, um, do you need to set like a DNS record then if you're doing it? You have to do it manually? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can automate it. So you don't have to set any DNS records. You can, you, all you have to do is write a cron job that runs certbot renew once a day. And how does it verify that you control the... Yeah, so, oh yeah, let's talk about how certbot works. Um, so <coughs> it talks to, when it when certbot wants to renew a certificate, it talks to Let's Encrypt. Um, and Let's Encrypt says, hey, can you issue a, hey, can you prove that you own this uh, public key? And issues you like a cryptographic challenge. Uh, and usually you answer that challenge over port 80. Uh, so uh, if, if you're running something that is not uh, a web server, um, it's actually better if you, if you want the firewall rules to still block port 80. Um, 
for some reason you can like punch a hole in it right before the renew in your cron job and then close the hole back up after the renew. Does that make sense? So you just need to open port 80 for the duration of the renewal, but other than that, it should work. Okay. Yeah. And then run. Yeah. Standalone. Uh, standalone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I hope that was informative for people. <laughs>